everyone how are we doing today how am i doing you ask uh well the month of jan was a good start even though i was down with covid for like 15 days but i'm all right now recovering well and i hope i look all right okay so now i know that you're here for ernest becker's the denial of death and i'm going to get to the book eventually but before that i'm just going to talk about the last gift by abdul razak gurna this book i finished reading about i think two weeks back and I've added timestamps in case you want to skip this chatter and go straight to the denial of death. Okay, so the last gift. Now this book, I have not read any other works of his, so I'm not acquainted with the sort of um, issues and themes that he uses and is referring to. And honestly speaking, I didn't even feel like doing any research. Uh, I don't know why I didn't feel like doing that for this book okay so the story is about this family father's name is Abbas now he's an immigrant from Zanzibar East Africa who runs away from his own family his own home because of poverty and um, and the many unfortunate things that happen to him there and somehow ends up in England where he meets this girl called Mariam and gets married to her now Mariam has a story of her own and often who has uh, who had to go through multiple foster families. So, you, you know, there's this sense of solitariness and uh, seclusion that both feel in their own individual lives and that they even unknowingly pass on to their children, Hannah and Jamal, by not sharing with them anything about their past, their identity, what happened with them and all the things that they had to do in order to cope and, you know, get away and start a new normal life. So when the father, Abbas, grows old and knows that death is near he feels the need to share these uh, secrets of his with uh, his kids Hannah and Jamal who are so entangled in their own feelings of alienation and this sense of having been betrayed by their own uh, parents even though the mother and father were always caring loving and polite towards them so I guess uh, one of the issues being addressed in the book, I think is, you know, the struggles of being an immigrant or the offspring of an immigrant and also coming from a mother who also comes from a place of this, you know, she's this empty void of a person with no selfness, with uh, with no lineage. And there's, there's just nothing about her that can be rooted into anything, anything that has importance or meaning. And there are certain lines in this book that are so profound so heartfelt so brutally honest and so sincere and it's because of them that i choose to read such books okay so i'm just going to read a few of them I've underlined these there are millions of them like that millions of us who do not fully belong in the places in which they live but who also do in many complicated ways you could find happiness in that and then it's just beautifully written. Hannah used to feel excluded by the intimacy of her parents at times, but now she understood it for what it was. They were adrift, out of their depth, lonely together. They had done this deliberately, she thought, cut themselves off, living timorous lives, expecting slights and disregard. And there's another one, last one, yeah. But then I suppose many people can say that, that about their lives. It may be that events constantly take us by surprise or perhaps traces of what is to become of us are present in our past and we only need to look behind us to see what we have become and there is really no need for amazement. Okay, so moving on. All right, a day later. It was actually yesterday that I shot the video for The Last Gift and for some reason I was unable to finish that video. So here I am today, all ready to share my experience of reading Ernest Becker's The Denial of Death. Now in this book, he talks about the why of human existence and he 
tackles the problem of the vital lie which is man's refusal to acknowledge his own mortality. In doing so, he sheds new light on the nature of humanity and issues a call to life and its living that still resonates more than 20 years after its writing. So uh, Ernest Becker was an anthropologist and he died in the year 1974. And if I'm not mistaken, this book came out in 1973. Now, this book is full of revelations that do not and cannot occur to you on your own, meaning you have to read books like these to understand your own nature, to understand human nature, irrespective of how difficult, unpleasant and sometimes even painful that experience may be. So in the book, he talks about how the world is terrifying and that makes us uh, naturally anxious beings. So in order to deny that anxiety, in order to deny that terror of the inevitability of death, you know, that empty, empty presence of our consciousness that has emerged from nothing, we build defense mechanisms through repressions, through conflicts, through the denial of our own bodily mortality. He refers to this as a heroic immortality project and in the book he talks a lot about repression and even narcissism as a matter of fact narcissism because we are so hopelessly and helplessly absorbed within ourselves in order to escape our own fragility i mean how ironic is that and you know he makes uh, this point so well so so well somewhere in the middle here where is that yeah even if the average man lives in a kind of obliviousness of anxiety it is because he has erected a massive wall of repressions to hide the problem of life and death his anality may protect him but all through history it is the normal average men who like locusts have laid waste to the world in order to forget themselves okay you know um um to my surprise, Ernest Becker writes a great deal about how repressing this huge burden of existence, both external and internal, is no deception. On the contrary, he says that repression is much needed if you want to distance yourself from the overwhelmingness of that burden. Sort of like, like you know, like an indifferent acceptance of uh, your life's limitations because you cannot experience everything and the text itself is so captivating and so cathartic because you know it makes you realize all these things about the way you think like your shadow self and and how you project your um, what would you call it uh, yeah your ignorance and your inferiority and fallibility as a human fated to die one day onto another person community object etc um, hitler would be a, a good example of that and and then he talks about transference now uh, i'll just read an excerpt from the book in which he explains that you know why this need for projection for transference and here he's referring to the submission sort of transference not the hateful and negative kind okay so let me read that yeah so projection is a necessary unburdening of the individual man cannot live closed upon himself and for himself he must project the meaning of his life outward the reason for it and even the blame for it we did not create ourselves but we are stuck with ourselves technically we say that transference is a distortion of reality but now we see that this distortion has two dimensions distortion due to the fear of life and death and distortion due to the heroic attempt to assure self-expansion and the intimate connection of one's inner self to surrounding nature in other words transference reflects the whole of the human condition and raises the largest philosophical question about that condition and now this is my most favorite part how big a piece of reality can man bite off without narrowing it down distortingly meaning to what extent will you allow illusion to you know sort of take over your life like on what 
level of illusion does one live? So he says that I think the whole question would be answered in terms of how much freedom, dignity and hope a given illusion provides. You know, he's um, dedicated an entire chapter to Kierkegaard, to the psychoanalyst Kierkegaard, and I extracted a lot of wisdom from that just one chapter. Yeah. The man with the clear head is the man who frees himself from those fantastic ideas. Now, by ideas, he means the characterological lie about reality and looks life in the face, realizes that everything in it is problematic and feels himself lost. This is the simple truth that to live is to feel oneself lost. He who accepts it has already begun to find himself to be on firm ground. Instinctively, as do the shipwrecked, he will look round for something to which to cling and that tragic, ruthless glance, absolutely sincere because it is a question of his salvation, will cause him to bring order into the chaos of his life. This reminds me of Jordan Peterson. Every time I read about bringing order into the chaos of life, I'm reminded of his lectures. So anyway, these are the only genuine ideas, the ideas of the shipwrecked. All the rest is rhetoric, posturing, farce. He who does not really feel himself lost is without remission. That is to say, he never finds himself, never comes up against his own reality. You know, it was Kierkegaard who said that the self must be broken in order to become a self. So you see how this book is not all despair, dread and anxiety. It is also about smashing your own um, idols and long held beliefs and you know accepting your life's uh, your own natural limitations and fears through self knowledge and um, in this book you also learn a lot about psychoanalysis and of course its founder is mentioned as well Sigmund Freud and then you have other psychoanalysts slash uh, psychotherapists mentioned in here so we have uh, there's Adler there's Otto Rank um, there's Jung of course and uh, even Norman O'Brown so you know a book like this is a, a great source that leads to other such equally insightful works and I've actually made a note of all the books that I want to buy so there's Norman O'Brown's Life Against Death Robert J. Lifton's Revolutionary Mortality. Then I have a list of uh, books by Otto Rank. So first is The Myth of the Birth of the Hero. Then we have Art and Artist. Then is The Incest Motif. And the fourth one is Trauma of Birth. Yeah, I feel like I'm forgetting one. Yeah, Adler's uh, Understanding Human Nature. So many books to buy and they're all expensive. So, yep, yeah, okay, so I'm going to leave it at that because I want to keep this short. It's, you know, it's so strange and ironic that every time I like a book, um, especially nonfiction, I, I don't like to talk much about it because I feel like I don't and won't do justice to all the heavy wisdom and knowledge that is installed in here. It's just unbelievable so uh, simply put I enjoyed reading this book I really 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 loved reading this book and it shifted the ground beneath me and no that is not an exaggeration and so I just wanted to share that with you all here on YouTube so I really hope that you read it and honestly speaking if you feel intimidated picking up books like these Trust me, that is just your lack of self-confidence talking because everything in here is, you know, it's, um, it can be understood. I mean, it agreed that it's not the easiest read, but that doesn't make it incomprehensible. So I really hope that you read this book and I really also hope that you uh, share your thoughts with me after reading the book. And uh, thank you so much for watching the video. I will see you guys at the next one.